Recording in progress. Okay, I just realized I've got a green sweater on. Looks like I have no have no body, <laughs> just one floating head. All right, hello everybody. Hopefully you're doing well. So, and hopefully you didn't have any problems with the uh, with the exam. Hopefully everything went off uh, well, at least um, you know no technical issues. So we're going to go ahead and get started with something a little bit easier today um, because the last, the last unit involved uh, taking those, uh, that heat diffusion equation and um, integrating it and getting a temperature distribution um, and figuring out, you know, temperatures at particular locations and then the um, um, uh, heat transfer rate, that sort of thing. So it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, so there's two questions. Number one, uh, test graded soon, question mark. Um, so the answer to that one is I just provided my uh, TAs the uh, answer key for all of the questions um, in the bank, and that sort of leads me into the next one. So uh, the other question, uh, Alex, the are you going to post a key? because it's online, it all comes from a question bank. So I shared the bank with my TAs, but if I share the bank with everybody, then I've sort of shot myself in the foot for the next time. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I've asked my TAs to give enough feedback so that you know, um, you know, what answer you should have gotten and, you know, give you some feedback on what you, you know, what, what the answer should have been. So hopefully that will help. Um, and I just, yep. And then I, I asked my TAs just to, uh, have it graded within two days. So hopefully within two days that will happen. Um, if not, then I'll touch base with them and, and see if I can get a, see if I could see, get a, a better indication of when they're going to finish. Okie dokie. So, um, on the bright side, today will be a relatively easy day because we're talking about Ohm's analogy and the whole point of Ohm's analogy is to make your life a little bit simpler. So Ohm's analogy is, um, if you watch the video, so don't like that, let's do that, okay. So Ohm's analogy, um, short day, uh, maybe, could be. Um, it, it may be a little bit short. We'll see. So um, let's cross our fingers and I'll, I'll try to talk quickly. The Ohm's analogy is um, sort of like Ohm's law. So with Ohm's law, you have current is equal to voltage over resistance. And so the analogy that we draw, we say, okay, well, I current is the flow of electrons. Well, Q is the flow of heat. And voltage is the driving force for the flow of those electrons. And the driving force for the flow of heat is the temperature differential. So that temperature differential is going to be T1 minus T2. And then the resistance to um, current would be, well, the resistance. And then we could also define a resistance to uh, heat transfer. And we're going to call that RT. So thermal resistance as opposed to uh, resistance to electric current. Um, and so what we'll end up doing is we'll draw these little circuit analogies where here's T1, here's T2, here's a thermal resistance, and then going through it from one end to the other is our heat transfer Q. I'll make that. So it, it, it's a cue. I'm sorry. Sometimes I draw the cues with like straight tails. Sometimes I put a little 
make it curved. Okay. So the deal is with these, uh, with using Ohm's analogy, it is only valid if we have steady state, one dimensional heat transfer with no heat generation. So if one of those things is not true within your medium, you can't use Ohm's analogy within that medium. Um, so um, it is, okay. oh, okay, hopefully my kids will get that. Okay, you're gonna have to deal with it about two seconds until one of my kids picks up. Oh, probably not. Okay, sorry. Um, who has a landline these days? I don't know. Apparently, yes. Um, lost my train of thought. Oh, so Ohm's analogy is kind of limited in what it can tell you. It can tell you the temperature at discrete points. It could tell you, um, yeah, it, it could tell you the temperature at discrete points. But if you need to know like a temperature distribution, for instance, then you're going to need to start with that heat diffusion equation and integrate and get um, T as a function of X or R if you're in cylindrical coordinates. Okay. So let's go ahead and start on problem one. So the first problem, we have a 10 millimeter thick window and I went ahead and assumed that I was gonna have a difficult time um, creating my, putting my drawings together. Um, so yeah, I went ahead and already drew them, but I'm gonna walk through them. And as I walk through them, hopefully you could be drawing these. So we have a 10 millimeter thick window. Uh, so let's see, hopefully. Uh, be nice if have a little, yeah, well, that's fine. So I've got a 10 millimeter thick window. So I put that, uh, X or L is equal to 0 0.01, uh, it's one meter high, two meters wide. Um, so that's the area on the right face has a thermal conductivity of 0.8. So that's this guy right here. Uh, the air in the room is 20 degrees and the heat transfer coefficient on the inner side is 10 watts per meter squared Kelvin. So that's this on this side. The outdoor air is at zero degrees and the heat transfer coefficient is 40 watts per meter squared Kelvin. You can assume that those convective heat transfer coefficients take convection and radiation to account. Um, so uh, it was mentioned, I think, in one of the very first videos that you would have watched prior to class where we introduced Newton's law of cooling that sometimes that you'll have this sort of combined heat transfer coefficient, convective heat transfer coefficient that takes into consideration convection and radiation effects that's all that's saying and all it's saying is this is your H and this is the H that you plug into Newton's law of cooling so don't overthink it we want to find the heat loss through the window so this is that guy and if you look at uh, my figure here my Q lost it's also the Q through my through my um, solid plane wall there um, and then we also want to find the temperature at the inner surface of the wall. So that's at T is X equals zero. That's on the red, uh, the left-hand side in red. And there you go. So I think we're ready to go. Um, it is steady state, one dimensional, because it's one, uh, one direction, right? Heat transfers in one direction in the X direction. And we clearly do not have any heat generation. And so Ohm's analogy is perfectly okay to use. So let's go ahead and use it. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I am going to put my little circuit together. All right. So I'm going to start, I'm going to have, let's see, one, two, three, four temperature nodes. So there's one temperature node, here's a resistance, here's another temperature node, here's a resistance, here's another temperature node, and here's a resistance. All right, so that first temperature node, let's put them in a dark orange here, is going to be our T infinity one. That's the 20 degrees that we have on the left hand side. And then let's do the next temperature, actually let's see. Oh, I might have another one. No, uh, no, 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 this is good. Uh, my next temperature is T at X equals zero, which is one of those things that I need to find. 
The next one is t at x equals l. And then the very last one, well, let's put him kind of in dark blue, is going to be t infinity 2. OK. So let's go ahead and define those thermal resistances. So it would be a nice thing to have my, uh, here we are my packet with all my equations in it. So Ohm's analogy is where we're looking. This is on page two of that heat transfer PDF. Um, you can see here's my Ohm's analogy right there in case we forget it. Um, and then we have for a plain wall, we've got two resistances, one to conduction and one to convection. So that's those are the equations that I'm going to use. So let's go ahead and go over here and plug them in. So the first resistance is going to be resistance to convection. It's going to be 1 over HA. So let's put, put that. So I have 1. There we go. 1 over, and it's H infinity 1A. And that A is going to be the same all the way through. The next one is going to be resistance to conduction. And so this is going to be, oops, not... K on the top, it's going to be L on the top, L over KA. And the next one is going to be resistance to convection. And this is going to be the same thing, except it's just going to be using a different uh, heat transfer coefficient. Perfect. All right. And so now, great. Let's go ahead and define that Q lost, which is just the same. It's just Q, right? It's Q all the way through. And so I could define that Q based on a temperature difference between any of those nodes. Um, it doesn't really matter. Um, but it looks like the only temperatures, the only temperatures that I know um, are this T infinity on the inner side and then the T infinity on the outer side. So I think that's probably kind of what I got to use. So I'm going to have to sum up all of those thermal resistances. So my Q is equal to, so I'm going to have a T difference on the top, but I do need to sum up all of those thermal resistances. So I have, and I'm going to put the area on the outside because it's going to be the same for all of it. So the area, the cross-sectional area through which heat uh, transfer is occurring perpendicularly is two meters squared. So two meters squared. And then I'm going to sum up all the rest of it. So I've got one, oops, one over 10 watts per meter squared Kelvin plus, then I have L over K. So L is 0 0.01 meter. Uh, my K is 0 0.8, 0 0.8, and it's watts per meter Kelvin plus and then i've got the resistance to convection so one over my 40 watts per meter squared kelvin and then on the top the temperature gradient that i'm talking about is going to oops i'm sorry this is going to be annoying can i delete you because that would be sweet mm. Give me a second. Ah, perfect. Aha. Yes, I do. Perfect. Because otherwise that's going to be super annoying. All right. So I've got my T infinity on the inner surface. So it's 20 degrees. And then on the outer surface, it's zero degrees Celsius. And so if I plug in those numbers, see what I end up getting. I've got uh, 290.9 watts. So 290.9 watts, and I'll put a happy little cloud around there because we're very happy that it's there. All right, very next thing I need to do, so that's, that's gonna be part A, and part B is asking for the temperature at a particular location. So this guy right here at X equals zero. And so I'm gonna do the same thing, but I'm only going to apply Ohm's analogy to this part of the, of the segment of the um, circuit there. All right, so I know what my Q is, right? I know my Q is equal to that 
290.9 watts, but now I'm going to define it again just between those two, those two temperature nodes, right? So my T infinity uh, on the inner surface, and then my T at X equals zero. And then on the bottom, I've, uh, oops, on the bottom, I've only got one thermal resistance to worry about, and that's going to be my one over H infinity times A, and it's H infinity on the inner side, which was 10. So I have 10 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Um, that's also multiplied by an area, oops, area being two meters squared. Okay, kind of off center, but that's okay. Oops, and I'm not, and it's just a matter of, of solving for what T at X equals zero is. Um, so I have 5.5 degrees Celsius. 5.5 degrees Celsius. I'll put a happy little cloud around that guy. Perfect. Right. And I think that is it for that one. Alrighty. So the next thing that I need is I have um, problem two. Let's go to that one. All right. So problem two, we have a 10 millimeter thick horizontal layer of water has a top surface temperature of negative four degrees and a bottom surface temperature of two degrees. So I'm gonna zoom in here and look at this. So on the top, on the top, four degrees. On the bottom, two degrees. And I'm sorry, it was negative four degrees, not four degrees, but negative four degrees on the top. Um, so it's, it's, it's since it's negative four degrees, it's frozen, right? And so um, it's going to be as long as it's above zero degrees, it's going to be um, a solid. It's going to be, I'm sorry, as long as it's below, <laughs> as long as it's below zero degrees, it's going to be a solid. It's going to be ice. And if it's above zero degrees, it's going to be a liquid. So clearly at some place between what's at two degrees and what's at, oops, what's at negative four degrees, you're going to have this interface where it's at zero degrees. Okay. And so it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't say that it doesn't say the solid liquid interface is at zero degrees, but we kind of have to put two and two together. All right. And then you can see that what I've done is I've put a, um, I've put a, um, um, a little coordinate system in here. So at Y equals zero, that's where, uh, it's two degrees at y equals 0 0.01 meters. It's at negative four degrees. So what I'm trying to find here, there. So what I'm trying to find, I'm trying to find what is that coordinate? What is, where is that interface located at? All right, so as far as my assumptions, steady state, one dimensional, no heat transfer. And so Ohm's analogy is going to help us again. We don't need the temperature distribution. We just need a particular location here. All right. So with that being said, let's go ahead and put our, um, uh, put our, our thermal circuit together. All right. So I'm going to put it horizontally. Okay, so I'm going to have three discrete temperature nodes. Okay, so I have one uh, at two degrees. I have the one in the middle, which is zero degrees. And then I have um, at uh, y is equal to 0 0.01 meters. Um, that's going to be at negative four degrees. Celsius. And so now I'm going to define each of those thermal resistances. So both of those are going to be by conduction. 
right? You've got a queue going through here. You've got a queue going through here. Um, and as you can see on the figure, I wrote that queue as a queue conduction because it's going through a stationary medium. Yes, in the red, that is a liquid, but the liquid is not moving. And so the, the mechanism of heat transfer is still by conduction. Okay, so as long as there, it's in a stationary medium, it's by conduction. All right, so then my, my um, remember my thermal resistance, if it's by conduction, and you can find this on your equation sheet, but it's L over Ka. Now, it does say that the thermal conductivity for liquid water and solid ice are different. We need to make sure that we pay attention to that, um, and we need to evaluate those using the data in A3 and A6. So we'll do that. Um, so let me draw it. Oh, so yeah. So we have a KL and a K ice. K for the liquid, K ice for ice. Um, the area for both of these is the same. I don't know what that area is, but maybe it's okay. Um, and then the L, we do need to define that L. So for the one in red for the liquid, that's pretty easy because it's just going to be... Um, uh, y interface that's the length right that's the thickness of that medium times k of that liquid times whatever this area is the other one for the ice okay great we have k of the ice and that's great um times the area same area doesn't matter even though i don't know it maybe it doesn't matter um, and then the thickness of it is going to be that 0 0.01 minus the y interface right we're looking at this thickness right here so t minus that y interface um, so let's do that so it's going to be 0 0.01 meters minus y interface all right so I've defined what those thermal resistances are. I do need to go look and see what the um, what the thermal conductivities are. Um, so, okay, so let's look in table A3. So table A3 has things for, has a thermal conductivity for ice. I mean, I'm sorry, which one's A3? Yeah, A3's got the one for ice. So that's going to be the blue one. So K ice and we need to, we do have two. I mean, I know it's so the average temperature is so close to either one. Um, but the thermal conductivity of ice really does need to be, um, you need to evaluate it at the average of this temperature and this temperature. So an average of negative two degrees. So this is going to be the K of ice at an average temperature of negative two degrees Celsius, which would be 271 Kelvin, because I suspect that those those guys are gonna be at, um, they're gonna be evaluated or, or written in terms of uh, Kelvin, but we'll see. And then in A6, so this is for liquid. Um, so that liquid water, it needs to be evaluated at its average temperature right, where the average temperature is going to be the average temperature of two degrees and zero degrees, which is just going to be one degree. I know it's not going to make that big a difference, but just, you know, humor me, I suppose. Okay, so one degree Celsius or 274 Kelvin. Okay, let's go look in the tables, yeah? Let's go look at table a3 see if we can find it do, 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 do. it's a1 on a going ah perfect all right so if you've got your pdf kind of pulled up somewhere it's on uh, page 25 of that pdf so you have to scroll down quite a bit um, but it is table a3 there's ice. Um, we're looking at thermal conductivity. You can see that um, they've given values for both 273 and 253. Um, we needed it. Uh, 
what was it, 271, which, okay, fine. It doesn't really make that big of a difference. I've got 1.895, so that's what I'm going with, but it won't make that much of a difference. So, but again, I, I did interpolate for this guy, and this is 1.895 watts per meter Kelvin. It's technically correct. It's the best type of correct. Okay, and then we needed to look up for liquid water. So we're going to go to table A6, which when you look at it, table A6 looks like your thermodynamic tables. In fact, they are thermodynamic tables, right? For water. So let's keep on going. Ah, perfect. All right. So this is what, it, what we're looking at. So this is table A6 thermophysical properties of saturated water. So these are your saturated water tables. Good times, right? It's all coming screaming back to you. So we do have thermal conductivity. And if we, I'm going to zoom in real quick. So you see that you've got uh, kg and then you've got this k. Um, and while it doesn't have anything um, written there as a subscript, uh, just know that this is you can imagine that there's a KF there, even though that's pretty, pretty horrendous. So just imagine there's a KF. That's the column for the saturated liquid um, values. And you may also remember that in thermodynamics, you may have used compressed liquid approximations. So you might, it may look familiar to you, this V uh, approximated as V sub F at whatever the temperature is. You had similar relationships for internal energy and enthalpy and entropy. That might look familiar to you. And we're going to do the same thing here. So we have liquid, um, right, liquid water, and we're going to model or we're going to approximate that as K sub F at whatever this temperature is. Same, it's another compressed liquid approximation. All right, so let's see what we've got. Uh, so we did need to, let's see. So we were looking at an average temperature of 274. So, <laughs> I mean, we're looking at right there. Average temperature, 274. So I'm going to be um, interpolating between those guys right there. Or I'm going to pretend like I interpolated and estimate it close enough. But I actually did interpolate. Um, one thing I do want to bring your attention to is this guy right here. That's actually already been multiplied by um, by a thousand. Um, so it's not 569. It's actually 0 0.569 and 0 0.574. And I evaluated uh, or interpolated for 0 0.571. So perfect. Point. Five, seven, one. Perfect. Almost perfect. Zero point five seven one, and it's watts per meter Kelvin. Perfect. So I think I have. I think I pretty much have everything. Now the only thing that I might be saying to myself is, ah, dang it, I don't actually have <clears throat> the area. But it doesn't matter because remember <clears throat> that Q, it's going through the entire thing. It's the same Q going from node to node to node. And so, okay, well, great. I'm defining that Q. Let's define it. Let's define it through this little section right here. Well, then I would have, I'd have on the bottom my thermal resistance, Y interface over, uh, K L times my area, which again, I don't know, but maybe it's okay. And then on the top, your temperature difference is going to be two degrees Celsius minus zero degrees Celsius. I could also, maybe I want to define it between these guys right here. That would be okay as well. So now I just have, all right, temperature difference is going to be zero degrees minus negative four degrees. And then my thermal resistance is going to be going to be 0 0.01 meters minus the Y interface over K 
k ice times that area. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set these two equal to one another. And if you look at why what I you know what I know and what I don't know, I know those those k values. I solved for those or I looked those up. Um, I'm trying to solve for the y interface. I don't know the area, but it doesn't really matter because I'm going to divide out that area or multiply it. Uh, I guess, yeah, I'll have to divide on both sides and that would get rid of the area. So step one, step two, step three. solve for that y interface. They have one equation and one unknown. So easy peasy. Um, well, it's kind of a, a little, little annoying bit of algebra, but 0 0.00131 meter. And that's our answer. Perfect. Okay, so problem, so that was problem two. Now we're on problem three. Hopefully, hopefully everybody's got it. Don't forget the video is available on YouTube after this and so you can rewind it if you need to. All right, so problem three. So we have a composite wall of an oven consists of three materials, two of which are of known thermal conductivity. So the, the thermal conductivities we know, we know the one in red and we know the one in blue. Um, so I know Ka, which is in red and Kc, which is in blue. I do not know Kb. I know the thicknesses of the wall uh, or of each of those, those um, components. So I know the length of A, the length of A is 0.3 meters. The length of B and C, which are the same, are 0.15 meters. And then the other thing they tell us is that uh, they tell us that um, under steady state operating conditions, measurements reveal an outer surface temperature of 20 degrees. So that's this one right here on the right hand side and an inner surface temperature of 600 degrees so that's on the left hand side and that's the surface temperature and then of course on the inner uh, the inner surface is exposed to this oven temperature which is at 800 degrees so we've got convection as well that we need to worry about and then we've given we're given a, a heat transfer coefficient of 25 watts per meter squared kelvin and we want to know what's what's that KB. So find KB. All right. Same assumptions. They did tell us steady state, right? Steady state is in there. So steady state, one dimensional, no mention of any Q dot. So perfect. Ohm's law applies. So let's go ahead and at least put our circuit together and think about what we're going to do. Uh, not assume that. All right, so I am going to have one, two, three, four, five temperature nodes, I believe. So there's one, two, three, four, five. All right, so let's label those, shall we? All right, so the first one is going to be that T infinity, which is 800 degrees Celsius. The next one is going to be that inner surface, which is at 600 degrees Celsius. The other two, I don't really know what they are, but I am going to, I'll put a little note. There's a temperature at length A, length B, and then that last one. Um, Make sure you can see that this guy is the outer surface temperature, uh, which is 20 degrees Celsius. All right. And I know if I, this is one dimensional steady state, what goes in, uh, one dimensional steady state and Q dot is equal to zero. So what goes in has to go out. So I'm going to, whoops, there we go. Yep, 
this Q, this Q, all the same. So it doesn't matter where I define that Q, you know, what resistances or what temperatures I define it between, it doesn't matter, it's the same. All right, so that first resistance on the left-hand side is due to convection. Perfect. Um, so I have one over H A. The next one is the one through the uh, layer A. So this is by conduction. And so it's going to be L and it's going to be L A over K A times A. Next one's going to be through K B. Um, put him as, you no. Know, put him like that. Okay. So KB is going to be, actually, I'm just going to put him as black. I know it doesn't matter. So this is going to be LB over KBA. And then the last one is going to be another uh, resistance to conduction. So it's going to be LC over KCA. All right. And so I'm supposed to find KB. I don't really need to find Q. Um, but what I can say is that, okay, well, I know Q. I just said I don't need to calculate it, but I am going to define it because I'm just going to define it between, let's define it between these two. And then I'll set that equal to the Q between this whole thing. So why am I picking those particular things? I need to define that Q between temperature nodes that I know, right? So defining it between this whole thing just introduces another unknown that I don't, I don't, I don't know. So it doesn't really help me. All right. So Q is equal to, all right. So the first one is going to be easy because it's just going to be that first little section right there. Um, and so it's going to be, I'll we'll have 800 degrees Celsius minus 600 degrees Celsius. And then my thermal resistance is going to be, and I'm going to put the area on the outside and we'll see why in just a hot second. Um, one over that 21 over H, which is 25 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Perfect. All right. And then I can also define it. I could define that Q between this whole thing, right? Between the other two nodes that I know. Okay. Or, you know what? Maybe I define it between these two or these three. In fact, I think I'm going to do that because that just like makes my equation a little bit shorter. Okay. So if I do that, well, then I'm going to have three resistances that I have to deal with. All of them have an area on the bottom. So I'm going to put that over there. So I've got first one's going to be in red. So it's going to be the length of A, 0 0.3 meters over Ka, which is 20 watts per meter Kelvin. All right. Next one is LB, which is 0 0.15 meter over my KB, which I don't know plus LC, 0 0.15 meter, over uh, the thermal conductivity of C, which is 50 watts per meter Kelvin. And then the temperature difference that I'm looking at there, 600, 600 degrees, and 20 degrees. All right. And it's the same thing. Now I'm going to set these guys equal. I'm going to divide out the area. I'm going to get rid of that. And I'm going to solve for that KB. So I end up getting a KB of 1.53. So it's going to be 1.53 and it's watts per meter Kelvin. And I'll put a happy little cloud around that. Perfect. pause there again remember you can go back and you can if you miss something 
go back to the video that's on that unit two playlist. Okay. All right. So problem four. All right. So problem four, it's another, it's another similar problem. Um, the one thing that I wish that they had actually done is just give you these K values and I'm going to do that. Um, so we've got a house with a composite wall of wood, fiberglass insulation, plasterboard, as indicated on the sketch on a cold winter day, we have, um, we've got these two heat, con uh, heat convection coefficients given to you is 60 and 30 watts per meter squared Kelvin. It's not on the diagram, but it's there in the problem set statement. And then the surface area, if we kind of looked at it like this, that area is given to us as 350 uh, meters squared. Um, and like I said, they didn't give you these K values. They can be found um, in your uh, in your charts. Um, but it might not be obvious about what temperature you need to give it at, get it at. Um, so I'm going to give you the values. So for the plaster, it's 0 0.17 watts per meter Kelvin. Um, for the glass fiber, so the fiberglass is 0 038 and it's watts per meter Kelvin. And then uh, for the plywood, it's 0 0.12 uh, again, and that's watts per meter Kelvin. All right. So 0 0.17, 0 0.038, 0 0.12. And then I think that's, that's all the information that's kind of missing from that figure there. And everything else is pretty, pretty cut and dry. So the first one, uh, part A is asking for a symbolic expression for the total thermal resistance of the wall, including the inside and the outside convection effects. Um, and so what they're looking for, all they're looking for is that total thermal resistance. So we're going to just sum it up, right? Next thing that they're looking for is the Q loss through the, the wall. Um, okay, great. That's just Q is Q. Um, and I don't know. Well, actually, that's fine. We'll, we'll leave it there. Um, we'll do that. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, if the wind were blowing right violently, raise a raise the outer convective heat transfer to instead of it being 60, it, now it's 300 watts per meter squared Kelvin, and we're gonna see if that makes a huge difference or not. Um, so, and then we want to figure out what is the controlling resistance that determines the amount of heat flux or heat flow flow through that wall. All right. So, well, I am going to assume. Steady state, one dimensional, clearly no heat being generated. Um, and so I'm going to use my Ohm's analogy because I don't really need to find a temperature distribution. I'm just figuring out Q and thermal resistances and Ohm's analogy should be just fine. All right. So let's see. I'm going to draw my circuit and I'm going to have, I'm going to have, let's see, there's one temperature, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so let's go ahead and draw it, and then we'll label what those temperatures are. So one, two, three, four, five. Sorry, my uh, <laughs> my resistance has got uh, uh, much more creative as I went on, um, but it's okay. All right, so this first one, T infinity I. So at the inner surface, it's 20 degrees. Uh, the next one is going to be the surface temperature. I don't think I know what that is. So um, in fact, I'm not even going to label it. I don't really need it. So, but this temperature right here would represent the temperature of this first surface. The next one would be 
this one would be the temperature at this surface, which you don't really need. I'm not even going to label it. Um, this one is going to be the temperature at this surface. I don't even need it, so I'm not even going to label it. And then the temperature at this surface, um, I don't need it, so I'm not going to label it. Um, and then, of course, that last one I do have. So this is T infinity for the outer surface, and that's negative 15 degrees Celsius. I'm saying that I don't really need it because, I mean, I'm going to have to calculate Q, and that's fine, but I can just base that upon those two temperatures that I do know on the uh, for the convection on either side, and then sum up all the resistances, which I'm going to have to do for part A anyway. All right. So first convective, first resistance is going to be due to convection. All right. And so this is going to be one over H a, and I do know a, so that's good. Um, so this is going to be one over and it's going to be H inner times the area. Next one is going to be through the plaster board. So this is going to be L, P over KP times the area. Next one is going to be through the fiberglass. So this is going to be LB over KB uh, times the area. The next one is going to be through the plywood. So it's going to be L, the plywood siding S, SLS, KS times the area. And then the very last one is going to be due to convection um, on the outside. So this is going to be 1 over H on the outside and times the area. Perfect. All right. So let's go ahead and at least get a governing equation or figure out what those resistances are. Um, so I think I'm actually going to put these on there. So we... We do actually have these. So for this one, 1 over H on the inner side times the area. This one ends up being 9.52. So 9.52, uh, oops, and it's not watts. And there's also a times 10 to the negative fifth. And it's you can write it as degrees Celsius per watt, or you could write it as Kelvin per watt. It doesn't matter. It's the same value. This guy ends up being 16.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. Um, and it's degrees Celsius per watt. This guy, so this is LB. LB was the... Um, fiberglass yeah so lbb is blanket so lb so this ends up being 752 times 10 to the negative fifth degrees celsius per watt uh then the plywood siding which is probably not going to have a terribly huge effect uh but it does have some so this is 47 6 times 10 to the negative fifth degrees Celsius per watt and then this guy right here is going to be 4.76 4.76 times 10 to the negative fifth and it's degrees Celsius per watt if we plug all those in um, so if I did sum up all of those resistances and I just add them up RT so they're all in series, right? So it's just going to be all of those thermal resistances uh, together. This ends up being 831 times 10 to the negative fifth degrees Celsius per watt. Or if you're more comfortable seeing Kelvin, that's okay too. It's Kelvin for, per watt. That's fine too. All right. Um, next thing. For part B that it asks for is for the total heat loss through the wall. So they're asking for Q, which is super easy now that we've summed up all those resistances. So for part, that's A, 
this is B. So B tells us it's Q and that equals, and it's going to be the temperature difference, uh, 20 degrees minus negative 15 degrees Celsius. And it's going to be over the total resistance over that whole, whole long thing, thing there, um, which again, we've already calculated. So 831 times 10 to the negative fifth, we'll leave it as degrees Celsius per watt. So it's clear why we end up with watts. Um, and I end up getting 4,210 watts, or if you want to, you could put that in kilowatts, 4.2 watt, uh, one kilowatts, kind of put that in a happy little bubble. All right. So can you show the given K values? Yes. Okay. So K for the plaster board. I'm trying to make sure that everything is is there so you can see it. But K for the plaster is 0.17 watts per meter Kelvin. For the glass fiber blanket, it's 0 0.038. And for the, the plywood siding, it's 0.12. All right, so part C was asking, okay, well, if the wind were blowing violently, raising H naught to 300 watts per meter squared, um, it brings it, oh, yeah, 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 I'm sorry. Here, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna zoom in so you can actually see it, okay? <laughs> so 0 0.17, 0 0.038, 0 0.12. <laughs> it's okay. It's like super tiny on the screen, I know. All right. So, yeah, part C is asking if the wind were blowing violently, raising the outer convective heat transfer coefficient to 300 watts per meter squared Kelvin, determine um, the percentage increase in the heat loss. Um, so, I don't even think I calculated the percentage increase um, because... I just kind of looked at what was going to happen to that term that I've got highlighted in yellow there. So, so this guy is the thermal resistance to convection on the outside. Um, and so we're asking, well, if, if we increased H, if we put it um, at three, if we said, well, now that H naught or H infinity naught is 300 watts per meter squared Kelvin, well, I plug it in, I would have ended up getting, zero point nine five times 10 to the negative fifth degrees Celsius per watt. Um, for that convective uh, thermal resistance on the outside. Um, and so the total, I'll call it total thermal resistance, wouldn't be 831 times 10 to the negative fifth. It would have been 826, which, okay, it yeah, it makes a difference, but it's not a huge difference. I mean, I don't know what percentage that is, but it ain't that much. Um, and that would have been uh, degrees Celsius per watt. So I'll just say for part C, not a big difference. Super small, right? Part D is asking what's the controlling resistances or resistance, right? Which one makes the biggest difference? Um, and so you're just looking, all you're doing is you're just looking at the terms in pink, right? So this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one as it is, and which one's the biggest one. Um, and so you can see this guy is clearly the biggest one. 
Um, and that one is for the one with little subscript B and that's for the fiberglass blanket. Um, so it's the, it's the fiberglass. So I'll call R T B. In other words, it's the fiberglass. No big shock there. It's the insulation, right? <laughs> okay. So go to the next one. So the next one is a problem where we don't have, um, we're not going to have a circuit where the thermal resistances are in series, but they're in parallel. So we'll look at that in just a hot second. Make it so we can see as much as we can. All right, so we have a composite wall, but we have two isotherms. One is at X equals zero and one is at X equals L. So I'm gonna zoom in here. Hopefully, hopefully you got what you need. If if not, you can go back later. There we go, okay. So we have one isotherm at X equals zero and that's zero degrees. And then the other one, I don't know what that temperature is at X equals L, um, but I do see that I've got some convection going on on the right hand side and that's at hundred degrees. So this side is gonna be hotter, whatever that temperature is. It's gonna be hotter than this one. Now I'm still, when I put my, when I draw the direction of my Q, I'm still gonna draw it in my figure going in the positive X direction. I'll just probably end up calculating a negative Q or hopefully I will. Um, and so the math will, the math will work out. All right, so I need to find Q. Need to find the rate of heat transfer through that wall. Perfect, all right, well, it's still one dimensional. How do I know it's one dimensional? Because there's only two isotherms that I've got. And so heat transfer is gonna go perpendicularly to those isotherms and it's gonna go in the X direction. That's gonna be perpendicular. So one dimensional, um, there's no indication that anything's changing with time. So steady state, no indication that I have any heat generation. I'll put that as zero, perfect. And so I can use Ohm's analogy. So, so solution. Perfect. All right. But my circuits are going to be a little bit different, right? I'm going to have a temperature node right here, right? And that's going to be zero degrees. A little space right there, just so it doesn't look ugly. All right. And it's going to split. And I have two resistances one there's the other okay all right there's my next node uh i don't know what that temperature is i don't think i need it so it doesn't really matter but it's it's going to be the temperature at x equals l and then i'm going to have a thermal resistance to convection and so this guy out here is going to be my t infinity which is 100 degrees Celsius. Perfect. So I've got two resistance, resistances to conduction. So it's going to be L over Ka. Again, if you forget, it's on your equation sheet. So it's the thermal resistance to conduction through a plane wall. So I have this guy is going to be L1 over K1A1. Bottom one is going to be L2, K2 over A2. And then the other one, the one on the right hand side is going to be the resistance to convection. So it's one over HA. But the area um, through which we've got heat transfer going is going to be A1 plus A2. So two meters squared. Um, but I'll write this down here just in terms of A1 and A2. So this is A1 plus A2 times that heat transfer, convective heat transfer coefficient. Okay. I guess, I don't know why I put H1 in my diagram. It's just H because there's no other H to, to, to keep track of. So, all right. 
So, solution. Um, so I know my Q, which is going in here, and it's the same one going out the other side. That Q is equal to, all right, it's going to be the difference in the two temperature nodes that I, that I know. So I've got zero degrees Celsius minus 100 degrees Celsius. So you can see already it's going to be a negative term, which indicates to me that, okay, well, it's just going in the opposite direction is what I drew on my figure, which is just fine as long as the math is telling you based on your figure which direction that Q is going. Um, and so I've got two resistances in parallel and one in series. So it's going to be, I'll put this as the total resistance in parallel. plus the resistance in series. And I can go ahead and plug in numbers right now because this is going to be uh, 1 over A1 plus A2, which is 2 meters squared. So 2 meters squared times that convective heat transfer coefficient, 1,000 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Perfect. All right, so I do need to figure out the resistances in parallel. If you do forget what, how to add, um, I mean, adding them in series is pretty easy, but uh, parallel you might forget. So let's look at our chart real quick. I'm sorry, I know y'all were probably copying it down. I'll go real quick. There we go. Right there. So it is on your equation sheet. You just need to remember to go look if you forget. Okay. So, all right, so I know that one over that total resistance for the resistance in parallel is equal to, all right, just the sum of over one over those resistances. So it's going to be one over L1 over K1A1 plus one over L2 k2 a2 and those values are given to us so i'm just going to go ahead it is plug and chug this guy well i don't know what one over um but the total resistance in parallel ends up being 0 0.033 with a line over it uh degree celsius per watt and so we can plug this guy in here um, and I end up getting a value of negative 2956 watts. And so I'll put a happy little cloud around there. Again, we did calculate a negative Q, which is kind of what I expected because again, um, even though my figure had it going in the direction of increasing X, I calculate a negative. So I know that Q really is going the other way. Okay. So problem six is going to be the same exact thing, but we have cylindrical coordinates instead. And it's going to be pretty much the same looking um, resistances for, well, it's going to be the same resistance uh, for convection. So if you look on your equation sheet, uh, the thermal resistance to convection in cylindrical coordinates is still one over HA. But in cylindrical coordinates, the resistance to convection is just a little bit different. There's a natural log in there. But again, it's still just plug and chug. You just pull it right off of your equation sheet. So let's go look at it. So here's my problem six. So I have a steam pipe. Outside diameter is 0.12 meters. And so since the outside diameter of this steam pipe is 0.12 meters, then, well, the inner radius is going to be 0.16. Okay. And then, um, and then it says it's insulated with a layer of calcium silicate 
Um, so that's what I've drawn in blue. Um, and it says that the calcium silicate is 20 millimeters thick. And so all that means is that outer radius R2 is going to have 20 millimeters or 0 0.02 meters added to that outer radius. So I've got two radius, uh, two radii. Yeah. And I guess, you know, I probably should have just, maybe I'll, because that almost looks kind of funky. It could be a little bit confusing. Stop that. Stop. Want that to be confusing to anybody. A little tedious now. It's okay. I've, I've already started, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish it. And this guy covered up too. Okay. There we go. That looks a little bit better. Okay. All right. And then we're given the temperature at each of those locations, right? On the, the, so if you look at that blue, the blue sleeve, that's the calcium, um, the calcium silicate. And so the temperature on the inside of that sleeve is the T at R1. And the temperature on the outside of the sleeve is uh, TR2. Okay. And so what we want to what we want to find, we want to find uh, the heat loss per unit length because we don't actually know what the length is. Um, and so we won't be able to find Q, but we will be able to find things in terms of Q per unit length. Again, steady state, no indication things are changing with time. Uh, one dimensional, one dimensional going to be in the radial direction, and then Q dot is equal to zero. So I do need to put together um, my, my uh, thermal circuit here, and it's going to be super simple. It's going to be super simple because right here's my sleeve. Um, this is a T at R1, and this is T at R2, and so. Yes, I'm going to have a resistance there, but it's just going to be the resistance to conduction. And so here we go. So here's one temperature. Here's the resistance again to conduction. Um, T at R1, 800 degrees uh, or 800 Kelvin. And then T at R2, which is 490 Kelvin. And then my Q is going straight through. And this thermal resistance, it's on your equation sheet. In fact, let's go look at it and make sure that we all agree that it is there, hopefully. Yeah. So, yeah. In cylindrical coordinates, this is where we're looking. So thermal resistance to conduction, natural log R2 over R1 over 2 pi L K. Perfect. All right. So this guy... Go ahead and at least write that. So this is the natural log R2 over R1 over 2 pi KL. Now K is something that I can go ahead and look up. Um, and, you know, I probably want to look up that K value uh, for calcium silicate at the average temperature. Uh, so what is that? <laughs> Uh, y'all probably get it faster than me. Um, so 800, so 1290 divided by 2, 645. Stop that. 645 Kelvin. And let's go look it up. So calcium silicate. Do you have to look? Let's see. Not terribly sure which one it's going to be in. Okay. Somewhere over here. Aha! There he is. There he is. So this is in table A3. Um, so A3 up at the top. And yay, we found calcium silicate and we got thermal conductivities at various temperatures. And you know what is really awesome is R645 is on there, which I mean, does that ever happen? I don't know. Um, but let's see. 
So that is behind my little color wheel there. So let's minimize this. That guy right there. 0 0.089. So I know it's bad. I know. I'll write it on the on my thing in just a hot second. But yeah, point, point zero 0.089 watts per meter galvin. Zero point zero eight nine watts per meter Kelvin. And like I said, this is going to be in table A3. Perfect. All right. And so at this point, as I'm looking at my at my um, at my um, little circuit there, it looks like I kind of have everything that I need except the length. But that's really not an issue. And let's see why. Reason why is because okay well i know q it's equal to temperature difference so 800 kelvin minus 490 kelvin and then i've got the thermal resistance on the bottom so natural log of r2 over r1 over 2 pi k which i now know to be 0 0.089 uh times the l um and that's all well and good. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to divide both sides by the length. And so, okay, divide both sides by the length, right? Put the length on the denominator. And so we can see, okay, well, great. This and this are going to go away. And so now I've got R1, I've got R2, I got K. What else could I need? Nothing. So I end up getting Q over L is equal to 603, and the units are going to be watts per meter. Perfect. And we're going to have a very similar problem for problem seven. Um, so, yeah. So just so you know, like uh, <laughs> Gabe asked way back at the beginning, short day. <laughs> um, I'm gonna end where we ended this morning with the pre with the class this morning. We got to about halfway through problem nine, and then we called it. Um, and so that's what I'm going to do as well. So if you're like itching, you know, like to to do something else. Um, like practice more heat transfer problems in your book or uh, something like that, um, then you could do that shortly. All right, let's move to problem seven. All right, so we have a steam pipe 20 meters long with an inner surface, inner and outer radius of six centimeters and eight centimeters respectively. So I've drawn that on our picture here. So I'm gonna zoom in on my picture so that you can see it. Um, so I've drawn my two, two radius, so six centimeters, eight centimeters, respectively. Um, the inner surface is at 100, 150 degrees Celsius, and the outer, uh, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the outer surface is at 60 degrees Celsius, great. And then uh, length is 20 meters. They also give us a thermal conductivity of 20 watts per meter Kelvin. And they want us to find, let's see what they're going to have us find. They want us to find, they even tell us, uh, <laughs> use Ohm's analogy. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. Steady state. Uh, Q dots equal to zero and one dimensional in the radial direction. And again, we want to find the heat loss. Uh, in this one, there wasn't really uh, a draw like, okay, here's T at R1, here's T at R2, and there's a thermal resistance in between the two. All right, easy peasy. So T at R1, 150 degrees Celsius. Uh, minus T at R2, which was my 60 degrees Celsius. Sorry, I'm, it's a slightly different blue. Um, and then uh, our thermal resistance to conduction is going to be our natural log R2 over R1, 2 pi 
R L. And we have all those things. Uh, actually, not 2 or pi R L. It's 2 pi K L. 2 pi K L. K being our 20 watts per meter Kelvin. And I have all those numbers. It's just a matter of plugging them in. So I end up getting a Q of... 785,868 watts, which is why insulation is super important. Okay. Easy peasy. All right. Everybody's quiet tonight. All right. Problem eight. Boy, this looks familiar, doesn't it? And wouldn't it have been nice <laughs> to be able to calculate or to be able to calculate things with Ohm's analogy in the last uh, unit? Uh, because this is the exact same problem as maybe it was the last problem. Might have been the last problem in unit one. So, but we have steam flowing through a pipe with an inner and outer diameter of two inches and 2.4 inches respectively. So it's a steam pipe. So hot surface, which I don't know the temperature of it. Oh gosh, it's terrible. I'm sorry. But yeah, that surface is hot. <laughs> um, and I mean, clearly it's all not cold, but it's older on the outside. You know, a nice crisp 160 degrees Fahrenheit. So, it bit, yeah, all relative. Um, and we need to find the heat transfer through the pipe. That's what we're looking for. So we've got steam uh, going through in the middle of it. So clearly we've got a convection term. And then you've got conduction through the pipe uh, solid between R1 and R2. And there we go. So I want to find Q. Okay. Go ahead and our buddy one dimensional steady state Q dot is equal to zero. All those things have to be true in order for, for us to take advantage of Ohm's analogy. Um, and let's go ahead and maybe put that thermal circuit over here. So we actually have three temperature nodes. First one is going to be that T infinity in the middle. So that's 250 degrees Celsius. And then, okay, great. We have a thermal resistance and that thermal resistance is going to be due to convection. Perfect. So I have one over H times the area. And the area that I'm looking at is going to be on the inner surface. Um, so it's going to be 2 pi R1 L. That's going to be the inner surface area. All right. And then I'm going to have another temperature node. That's going to be uh, whatever that T at R1 is, which I, I don't know, but maybe it doesn't really matter. Um, and then I've got another resistance due to conduction. So this guy is going to be the natural log of R2 over R1. And we've got a 2 pi KL. Perfect. And then that last one is going to be the temperature at the outer surface, which is at T at R1. Yeah, or R2, I'm sorry, R2. Um, and that one is 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And somebody's being like super patient with me. That is not degrees Celsius degrees Fahrenheit. All right. And because it's one dimensional, steady state, no Q dot, whatever Q is going in at one end is going out the other side. Perfect. So I need to find Q. Let's go ahead and define him between some known temperatures. And that looks like the two endpoints. So I do need to add these up. And since it is in English units, I think I want to go ahead and write those units out um, just to have it. Okay. So I have the first one. So it's going to be one over, one over. And I'm going to have the convective heat transfer coefficient. So 12.5 uh, BTU per 
hour foot squared times degree Fahrenheit that's the H value then I've got the area which we said was 2 pi r1 uh, 2 inches and then the length which is 30 feet um, probably need to reconcile those inches and feet okay so okay well that's that's the first resistance and then we also have a resistance to conv uh, convection uh, I'm sorry uh, conduction so natural log and as far as converting those inches to feet it doesn't really matter with the natural log as long as the units are in the same or the same on the top and the bottom it doesn't matter because it's the natural log of a unitless parameter so 2.4 over 2 um, over my 2 pi times k k was given to us as 7.2 so 7.2 btu per hour foot degree fahrenheit perfect uh and then we also have the length which is 30 feet oh my goodness okay and now i'll put the temperature difference on the top um temperature difference being 250 degrees fahrenheit minus 160 degrees fahrenheit um, and if i look at like how the units are going to work out Let's make sure we got it. So I got inches, inches. I got feet squared, feet squared. Here's a foot, here's a foot. Uh, realize this doesn't even look like Fahrenheit anymore. Um, and then the Fahrenheit is actually going to go away as well. Those Fahrenheit will cross out those Fahrenheit. And so I should be left with BTU per hour as a unit. Um, and so my Q ends up being... 33,555 um, and it's BTU per hour and then I'll put a happy little cloud around there. One or half one. <laughs> I'll, I'm gonna go on, but if 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 you want me to wait, just throw it in the message, uh, throw it in the chat. Wait, and I'll wait a hot second, okay? Start going. Let's zoom it. Then. All right. So there was a question: um, Will we ever have a radial problem? that's in parallel that's a good question and i can't no no so you might have one uh you might have one for you know you might have a parallel one like the one that we did for the plane wall but i won't we won't do one for a radial yeah. all right so we'll go ahead and go to that last one perfect here we go what a beautiful, beautiful picture. All right. And I believe this one, the problem statement left out so many things. <laughs> so I don't think, yeah. So let's walk through it. So it says a long cylinder, 10 meters long, great, radius of 0 0.001 meters. So the cylinder that they're talking about is the one that I've got like light gray. Um, so somebody asked, how do you know whether to put one over H or the natural log? It depends on what kind of mode of heat transfer that you've got. If it's by convection, your thermal resistance to convect, uh, your thermal resist, go, go, go. Your thermal resistance to convection is going to be a one over H A. It's, if it's between, if the two temperature nodes are, uh, separated by a solid or a stationary liquid, it's going to be by con conduction. Okay. All right. So we've got the length check. Uh, we've got the initial radius. Um, 
for the initial radius, the radius of that long cylinder that's in gray, and then it's covered with a 0 0.001 meter thick material. Um, so that is the outer radius there. So we've got this kind of sleeve. Oh yeah, no problem. We've they've got this. We got this sleeve on the outside, um, and that outer radius uh, due to that extra little thickness is 0 0.002. So we want to find the temperature at R1. Great, easy enough. Um, and then another piece of information. Yeah, they tell us that there also determine the outer outside radius required to maximize that heat transfer from the cil cylinder to an environment that it's at 30 degrees Celsius. And another piece of information that is not in that problem statement is the convective heat transfer coefficient H. Um, so I've given that to you. The other piece of information that is just not on there is that you do have a, a known Q. So the Q through this, uh, or the Q, the heat loss. So why don't we just, I'll call it like this. I'll say the heat loss through the pipe. making up words here, um, is 80 watts. So that is missing as well. Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're wanting to find two things here. So thing number one that we're going to find, we need to find T at R1. Great. So we're going to do that tonight. And then tomorrow we're going to find what's called the critical radius of insulation. So it says this is, we look at the problem statement, it says it's the outside radius R2 required to maximize that heat transfer to the environment. Um, and so we're going to, we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail uh, tomorrow. But for now, let's put our thermal circuit together because it should be pretty darn easy. Here's our R1, here's our R2, and then we've got convection on the outside. So we're going to have thermal resistance to conduction and then we're also going to have thermal resistance to convection. So I'm going to go ahead and put that together a little bit more prettily. prettily. So T at R1 thing we're looking for. T at R1 and then I've got thermal resistance to conduction which is going to be natural log R2 over R1 over 2 pi K, L, I know K, I know L, I think K was another one of those things that wasn't even in the problem statement. So yeah, do please note that K is 0.15 watts per meter Kelvin. I don't know what was going on with this problem. Do, do, I apologize. All right. And then the temperature at R2, I don't know that one, but it's okay. Maybe I don't really care. And then the temperature T infinity, we said that was 30 degrees. Um, and then the thermal resistance to convection is one over H times the area. And the area through which heat transfer occurs is along that outer radius. So it's gonna be two pi R two, two pi R two times the length. That's going to be the area. And I think, I think I have all these things. So here's my Q, which is given to me as 80 watts. So let's go ahead and put that together. So I have 80 watts. There's my Q is equal to some of my resistances. So natural log, um, I'm not going to write it, but R1 and R2 were given to you. So 2 pi k is given to you, l is given to you, 1 over, I'm going to put the 2 pi on the outside, 2 pi r2 h l, I just re rearranged it so it looked a little bit better, and then the temperature difference on the top is going to be t r1 minus t infinity, which is 30 degrees, so I know everything here, I know everything in this term and this term, and so the only thing that I need I need T at R1. Uh, so I end up getting a value of 
62.4 degrees Celsius, which seems to make seems to make sense. Okay, based on what I know about the temperature um, on the outside of this thing being 30 degrees and the fact that we're losing heat. Um, yeah, so inside would have to be hotter. Okay. All right. And like I said, we will pick up next time uh, with part B. If you have questions, please let me know. Could you scroll up to problem four real quick? Problem four. Absolutely. Thank you. I just need to copy one or two things down. Okay. Is that good or you want me to zoom in anywhere? Oh, that's good. Thank you. Okay. All right, guys. All right, I'm gonna put my, I'm gonna turn my camera off so it doesn't look like I'm just staring at you. Um, and then if nobody's talking in the next little bit, I'll put the five minute timer on. And that way, if you think of any questions you'd like to ask, you just pipe right up and I won't go anywhere, okay? All right. Could you scroll into part E or C on the right side there? This guy. Yeah, thank that you. That look good. Yep. Yeah. 